Last week started with a great win for media freedom. Justin Trudeau's hand-picked Election Debates Commission in collusion with the government-funded Parliamentary Press Gallery had rejected the accreditation requests of two rebel journalists, Keen Bexty and David Menzies, and our friend Andrew Lawton from True North. They rejected us at the last possible moment on the Friday, and of course the debate was on Monday, so we went to court on Monday morning to seek an emergency injunction. Trudeau sent five government lawyers to oppose our emergency application, but miracle of miracles, we won. Justice Russell Zinn issued a court order directing Trudeau's staff to accredit the three journalists. And boy, did they ever do a great job. You, you could see the politicians of every party hadn't faced such tough questions on the campaign trail in a long time. But the meanest reaction was from rival journalists, especially from Trudeau, a CBC state broadcaster. They hated everything about Keen and David and Andrew being there. They hated the fact that conservative-leaning journalists even exist, that they were allowed into this debate, that they were allowed to ask questions, and that every network in the country that was running the debates live actually broadcast the questions. Boy, those rival journalists. We're steaming mad now. I don't care if they're mad at us. Frankly, we're frequently mad at them. It's your civil right to be mad at journalists or politicians. I recommend it, in fact. And you can ignore journalists you don't like, or you can challenge them or rebut them or do a better job than them, whatever. Well, not quite, because you, you can't quite ignore the CBC stuff to pay for it out of your taxes, I guess. And no, the problem wasn't that our rivals have a rivalry with us. It's that Without the court order, we wouldn't have even been allowed into the process, not even allowed into the building. As I showed you last week, Trudeau's commission accredited foreigners, including from the state broadcaster of the OPEC dictatorship, Al Jazeera. So they let anyone in except us. They didn't want to even let us share a national platform with them. That word platform, a platform is what it sounds like. It could be a stage, for example. It could also be a website. Facebook, Twitter, those are called platforms. The difference between a platform and a publisher is that a platform is just a neutral canvas upon which anyone can paint anything. It's like, a, it's like a bulletin board. You can tack a notice to it. There's really no editor. A publisher, as opposed to a platform, a publisher creates or edits or curates content, it takes a point of view, chooses, makes decisions about what's good and what's bad. So a newspaper is a publisher. A payphone is a platform. It doesn't determine what you can say or not into the phone. It's neutral. That's sort of obvious, but deplatforming is the tactic of the new authoritarian left to ban you from even once neutral places where you used to have the right to go. You can't really expect a local newspaper to run your letter to the editor if they don't want to. I mean, they might have a journalistic or a legal reason why they should, but at the end of the day, it's a private publication that gets to choose what they put in it. By contrast, you can assume that you're allowed to say whatever you like when you pick up a phone at a phone booth. But deplatforming is the radical idea that no, you can't. Now nothing is neutral, nothing is public. Everything can be blocked or banned if you don't think correctly. It's radical in itself and it's corrosive in that it's a substitute for the normal way we have disagreed with each other in the past. No need to debate anyone on a platform like before. Now just remove the platform from them and they're gone. I note that there was an all-candidates debate recently in the election, but the PPC candidate was banned from participating because the mosque that was hosting the debate said the party was beyond the pale, beyond even debating. What's the purpose of a debate if not to debate, though? Why bother having a debate if you've already decided without debate by ruling one party out? Now, I note that the PPC candidate in question is Muslim himself, our friend Salim Mansour. That's deplatforming. It's un-Canadian, by the way. I'm not saying every single debate forum has to have every single candidate on it. Sometimes you have 20 people running for mayor, for example, but you can see the trend. And now that the leaders' debates are over, I'm certain that we will go right back to being deplatformed by our fellow journalists uh, and by all the parties. I should point out it was at an Andrew Scheer event, not a liberal event, that David Menzies was handcuffed. I see the gray area with the mosque forum. I mean, it was their own mosque, I guess. I don't see the gray area with a national debate run by the government. But the deplatforming that happened to me on Thursday at Edmonton's Princess Theatre was the clearest of all cases. There wasn't any wiggle room there, no gray area there. I had a contract with the theatre. It was a done deal. I had paid 
the full fee in advance. There, the analogy here isn't even a bulletin board or some public park. It was a contract for money between me and the theater owner. We had done it before with great success a couple of years ago. I know the owner. He liked doing business with us. So we had a contract. That's not us just hop, hopping up in a town square on a fruit box and yapping. That's a contract. And yet he breached the contract. I don't propose to rehearse how it all went down. I told some of the story last week on YouTube. But basically the owner, who himself is an immigrant to Canada from India, his name is Mike Brar, he told me he was starting to get threats and pressure from NDP activists in Edmonton, and not just from nobodies. Uh, the former NDP MLA, Jessica Littlewood, was pressuring the theater to cancel us and said no one should rent to us. Uh, there was an activist from Progress Alberta, Rachel Notley's pressure group, doing the same thing. These are official people with high stations in public life. Uh, there's a professor that was doing the same thing. There was a hairdresser. A whole whack of people from every walk of life were pressuring this poor businessman. I talked with him on the phone, and he said he was getting so many hostile phone calls, he couldn't sleep at night. He was so terrified, worried, scared. So he canceled them. By canceled, I mean he breached his contract to me. He kept the doors locked. I told him he didn't need to worry. We hired a private security team to make sure no ruffians came, and no ruffians did come. There was all those really tough Antifa losers who were really butch online. None of them bothered to show up. Just one crank known around Edmonton as Rickshaw Dave, really the village idiot. 200 supporters came and one kook. There literally was nothing to be afraid of. And even if there was, I had worked with police and they had a big presence right there. So I wasn't just deplatformed as in denied a platform in the first place. I mean, I respect Mike Barrar's right to have said to me in the first place, we don't want to rent to you to begin with. I think I would respect that. At least I'm not sure if it violates my civil rights in some way. I'd have to think about it more. But I guess had he said that at the beginning, at least I wouldn't have spent time and money advertising and promoting that venue and buying a plane ticket there and getting all my friends to show up there. Had he just said no in the first place, but he didn't say no. He said yes. And I paid him a lot of money. And we even had a discussion about freedom of speech and he agreed to protect mine. But he didn't. He breached his contract to me. So I have a legal remedy against him. I can sue him for any damages, but I can also sue the people who pressured him to break his contract. I found this summary of the law on the website of a Canadian law firm called Lawson Lundell out of BC. <clears throat> it's sort of a, you know, law for beginners kind of publication. Let me quote it to you, okay? I, I think it's very good. Although the tort of inducing breach of contract is rooted in medieval law of master and servant, the modern version stems from the 1853 House of Lords case, Lumley versus Guy. In Lumley, the plaintiff had a contract with an opera singer, Miss Wagner to sing exclusively at his theater. The defendant, who wanted to showcase Ms. Wagner's talents at his own theater, and for his own benefit, persuaded Ms. Wagner to break her contract with the plaintiff and sing exclusively for him. The plaintiff took action against the defendant, and although the defendant was not a party to the contract, he was found liable. That's what inducing a breach of contract is usually about. Someone tries to steal someone away a professional athlete, a top executive, a brilliant scientist, a record label stealing a musician away from a rival record label. But it absolutely would apply to my case too, even though it's not like the bullies who bullied Mike Brar got any economic benefit out of it. They didn't steal the theater away for their own um, show, for example. Um, <clears throat> they were just being malicious. In my mind, that actually makes it worse. They were just being purely destructive. It's not like they were even trying to do something better than me. They were just trying to destroy my event by bullying my business partner, Mr. Brar. That's what he was, that's what the theater was. So I, I met with our Edmonton lawyers and he, we came up with a plan. We're just gonna sue everyone. Everyone who was dumb enough to reveal themselves as a bully, bullying Mike Brar to breach the contract. So those who were the most cowardly, who made anonymous threats to Mike Brar, to scare him, I'll probably never catch them, but Jessica Littlewood, Professor Lavelle, all the other people who worked for Notley, you bet I got their names, because they're under some weird impression that they can harm businesses like ours and like Mike Brar's just because they're more noble in their minds, but they're not more noble. It's not noble to stop a book launch. That's like a form of book burning, right? It's really gross, and it did dawn on me that Mike Brar is a minority immigrant, I'm Jewish, and my book is being metaphorically burned. I think that's not a good look on the NDP. If a judge would be appalled by one opera company stealing a singer from another opera company for profit, I can only imagine that a judge would be appalled 
by someone wrecking a book launch just out of censorship and spite. That's so contrary to the public interest, it hardly needs to be argued. But that is my plan. Ironically, the fact that I had a platform and it was taken away is precisely what gives me the legal standing to sue all of these harassers for the damages they caused. And I plan to sue every single one because I truly believe it's just a small number of bullies who have never been stood up to before, ever. I doubt there are 50 people in all of Edmonton, a city of a million, who behave this way. 50 people are enough, though, to make a city of a million unfree, at least when it comes to books or political events. That's a kind of tyranny. I'm not about to be tyrannized or bullied. They need to be taught what they did was wrong and that they can't do it with impunity. I believe that by suing these people, 10, 20, 50 of them, whatever, they'll get a real education about right and wrong that they never got from their mama. I believe they won't be so quick to deplatform anyone again, certainly not me. And I believe that it will serve as a larger deterrent to this awful authoritarian practice of deplatforming. I don't think this approach could work say, for Salim Mansour in that mosque, because he didn't have a contract with them that was breached. But it would sure work with someone who tried to have a conference um, and had a contract, but bullies had that conference canceled. Well, not if they just tried, if the conference was actually canceled. So I'm excited about this. It was a bad thing that was done to me, but it's a great way to fight back by using the law. It's a teachable moment, and it's a moment of counter-revolution. For a decade, we've seen the speedy infringement of our freedom of speech. I think this is a way to fight back. I'm setting up a website at stopdeplatforming.com. It's just very basic for now, but over the weeks and months ahead, you'll see more, and it's where we'll post all of our news about the lawsuit, and of course, we'll post the lawsuit itself, and it won't surprise you to hear we need your help to pay for this. I, I don't think we'll win much in the lawsuit in terms of damages, It'll surely cost us many times that in terms of legal fees. But this isn't about money. It's about stopping the bullies one at a time or 50 at a time and standing up for platforms for everyone, even people with whom we disagree. If you can help chip in, please do at stopdeplatforming.com. And if you hear of anyone else who has a contract with a restaurant or a bar or a theater or a convention center and that contract was breached because bullies bullied a venue owner, let me know. I'd love to see lawsuits like this everywhere. That's an excerpt from The Ezra Levant Show, which is a show I do every day. I do a monologue, interview an interesting guest, and then I read my hate mail. But you've got to subscribe to it, which you can do at premium.rebelnews.com.